What is up guys? Welcome back to another Monday Night Rewind podcast where we go back 20 years to the Monday Night Wars and cover episodes of Raw and Nitro from 1997. And this week we're going to November 3rd, 1997 and covering Raw 232 and Nitro 112. So of course we'll start off with Raw and then move on to Nitro. And so with these shows, or at least Raw, this is coming off or leading up or right before the, sorry, the episode right Right before um, Survivor Series 1997, so that's kind of a big thing with the whole Montreal screw job and everything. So that's what we're going to have to look forward to the fallout from that next week. Um, but for this week, we'll go ahead and start with Raw. And again, this is Raw 232, and it took place in Hershey, Pennsylvania, which um, that is one thing. They both took place in Pennsylvania, so they're just right down the. Or I don't know about down the road. I don't know what the geography of Pennsylvania is, but they're in the same state and stuff. So I'm surprised there's not more confrontation going on there. Um, but Raw started out with Vince McMahon in the ring uh, bringing Stone Cold out for an interview. And so Stone Cold's talking about, of course, how he's ready for a match against Owen at Survivor Series, which they have for the Intercontinental title. And then they show a replay of the attack last week that um, Stone Cold ran in on the Ahmed versus Owen Hart match and stunned Ahmed to keep the title on Owen. And so it's playing off Ahmed being mad about that or whatever. And so Cold says, kind of like gives a little thing to Ahmed saying, you know, if you stick your nose in my business, you're going to get your ass whipped or I'm going to whip your ass or whatever. And that causes Ahmed just Ahmed Johnson to come out to the ring and of course as he's walking down the ramp there's like referees and officials like surrounding him trying to like stop him and everything and he gets in the ring and grabs Mike and uh, he threatens to kick Stone Cold's ass and stuff and then he challenges him to a match tonight and Austin uh, says you know I would be happy to whip your ass tonight and then says if you'd like to see that let, give me a hell yeah and stuff the crowd does the whole hell yeah thing or whatever and so that sets up for a match later tonight between the two of them and then from there we go into our first match, which is Super Loco, which I believe is Super Crazy, at least by the look of him, and with Super Loco and Super Crazy, same name, so Super Crazy from ECW fame and stuff, versus Aguila. So this is the first time we get to see Aguila. Um, so this is a light heavyweight, or yeah, forget what they call it, yeah, light heavyweight match, I think is whatever, their uh, cruiserweight division that they're calling it. And this is the first match of the... Uh, I don't know what they call it, like the round for the um, light heavyweight thing. So they're going to have different uh, matches stuff. So there's a whole like bracket and everything leading to a match. I was going to say a Survivor Series, but this is like the first round. So I doubt it. it's that Survivor Series. Um, but they'll have a probably at the December pay-per-view or something. So Sunny comes out and does the introduction because she does all of them for these light heavyweight matches. And then Brian Christopher is out on commentary. So of course talking about how, how he can beat all these guys and stuff. But in the match, um, or first Aguila comes out and uh, JR mentions that Aguila means eagle in Spanish and that he's just 19 years old. And uh, I noticed that by the way he looks when he came out. I'm like, that looks so much like Juventud Guerrero. Like they look exactly the same and have very similar mask and everything. Thing. Um, but in the actual match, at one point, Aguila does a twisted tope con Hilo um, out onto Super Crazy on the floor. So that's kind of a cool high flying uh, move that he did there. Um, then at one point, uh, Loco or Super Loco, whatever, um, has Aguila in a surfboard and he does like a roll thing around the ring. Um, then at one point, Aguila hits a moonsault off the top rope onto Loco on the floor. And then Aguila ends up getting the pin with a cross body off the top rope. And then from there, we go into a JR interview, a sit down interview, like a pre done thing, whatever, with Gold Dust and Marlena, or in this case, Dustin and Terry Ryan tunnels because they're out of character type thing in this and so this is kind of a big part of gold dust history and stuff going on here um so they start off the interview interview by talking about their daughter dakota or at least terry does with jr and men they shows like little videos of her and them at the beach and stuff and uh she's all talking about this and how happy she is and everything and gold dust stops her and he's like you know i'm tired of living this lie and uh i've been living my life for you and my dad so bringing up dusty and stuff like that and that he's just tired of it and uh ready to just have a change of life or something like that and he's like when you were gone obviously i assume with the whole uh brian pillman stuff he says i was reaching out for something and someone found me and it's someone that understands me and knows what i'm going through and um, knows me and stuff unlike you terry that just doesn't care and then he mentions how he does not love marlena or terry and uh he hasn't for a long time and he takes his ring off and hands it to her and says, you can take that and you can take Marlena and you can shove it up your ass. And so he's 
pretty much breaking it off with Terry. And I know they get divorced. And I don't know if they're divorced now or this is the beginning of it. But obviously Goldust takes a wide left turn off from here to go into his new like character stuff he turns into. And then from there we go into a video package on the history of Brett and Sean going back to WrestleMania 12 and then a bunch of stuff in between now and or that time and now. And then that goes into the match that's supposed to be Ahmed versus Stone Cold so that match. But after Ahmed comes out instead of Stone Cold Kane comes out and starts attacking Ahmed. Um, but as soon as Kane gets in the ring, Ahmed starts fighting back against him, but Kane gets the upper hand and is able to hit him with a choke slam and then two tombstones. And he's, I think, going for a third one because he's starting to uh, get Ahmed off the mat. And uh, Mankind ends up running out and starts uh, attacking, and he puts the mandible claw on Paul Bear. And then uh, he has the giant, like, what they're calling a turnbuckle bolt. So it's the part that connects the turnbuckle to the ring post. So, like, if you look, this, they usually have a pad over it, um, but if you look at it, that's what he has of some sort. But he has one of that, and he hits Kane on the head with it, and it bends and stuff. And, you know, the commentary is making a statement how, you know, that's a solid steel bolt type thing. And he just bent it over Kane's head and stuff. And then they go to the outside, and Mankind grabs a chair, and then is kind of... Uh, holding it and standing in front of Ahmed who's on the ground and he's just kind of like facing Kane waiting for Kane to come kind of like fending off Kane from Ahmed and so that ends and we come back from a commercial probably and Stone Cold ends up coming out to the ring and he cuts a whole promo th and he says that um he'll still fight Ahmed if he wants to come back out or he'll face anybody at this point and so he's there waiting and waiting and waiting and the nation domination music plays and they all come out onto the ramp and uh, they all start to walk towards the ring and Kama like gets out in front and he gets into the ring and so commentary mentions oh I guess Kama has decided to do it and so he gets in the ring to start a uh, match with Stone Cold but right before the match even starts or right as the bell rings or something the Legion of Doom come running out and start attacking the rest of the nation from behind so they're like you know on uh, ringside there on the ground and so they're all fighting so that distracts Kama and from there Kama turns around to go um, you know pay attention to Stone Cold but as he does Stone Cold hits him with a stunner and then uh, he gets out of the ring and just walks out up the ramp and stuff leaving the LOD to fight with the nation and everything and then from there we go into hour two and it kicks off with Michael Cole in the ring and he brings out uh, Shawn Michaels and DJ or well he calls out Shawn Michaels but all of DX comes out and uh, so as they get into the ring and stuff they play a replay of the uh, attack last week that Sean did on Brett in the Brett versus Ken Shamrock match and uh, so before they Sean starts talking or anything to Michael Cole for some reason he kisses Triple H and then China on the lips I don't know what the whole point of that of course then the crowd sta started chanting um some I don't know what you call them some sexual remarks or whatever in regards to that but before Sean really starts talking uh Triple H grabs the mic for Michael Cole and he starts you know kind of like harassing Michael Cole and grabs his hand and shaking and stuff and then he pushes on Michael Cole and China is kne uh, kneeling down on her hands and knees behind him so when Triple H pushes him he falls backwards onto the ground and stuff and so Cole just gives up and he leaves the ring and stuff leaving DX to you know do their own interview type thing and they start off by making uh, fun of Hulk Hogan or making references to Hulk Hogan making fun of him and stuff like Age in the Cage so the Halloween Havoc match with Roddy Piper and stuff and then Sean starts talking and he uh, makes the remarks that uh, he's gonna make two promises for next week number one is that he's gonna walk out to the ring naked so that's kind of a weird thing I guess and then that number two he'll show Ken Shamrock who the real most dangerous man in the world is and referencing you know sexual type stuff whatever and immediately after that Sergeant Slaughter comes out to the ring and to make like a match and stuff and this is when uh, before he starts to talk they stop him and they go over and put on the like SWAT team face guards so like the uh, helmet things with the clear mask on it and then he goes to start talking and they stop and they go grab stuff out of the bag again and it's a little windshield wiper so they put them on and so the mask have a little windshield wipers going across the stuff so that's a pretty famous part of DX and he ends up declaring or making a match that Sean will face Ken Shamrock in a match tonight instead of next week like it's scheduled and so that upsets like Sean and stuff since he has you know a big match with Brett coming up this weekend and he now has to face Shamrock. 
Then from there we get a little like video clip of Mark Marrow in the back like locker room area and he's walking down the hallway and he goes to a door and it says Sable on it and he opens it and as he opens it Sable is standing there like putting her leather outfit on but it's only like up to her waist and so you can see of course she has her back to the camera but you can see she's got no top on and her breasts are hanging out and stuff like that but obviously you don't really you can't see it. But uh, he goes in and he's like rushing around. He's like rushing her because he has a match coming up. So he's rushing around and stuff. And so she quickly throws her hands over her chest. And as he pushes her out into the hallway and stuff. And so uh, really first, I guess probably not the first. But first that I've noticed out of the um, episodes we've done so far. That she's really, you know, starting to do the more sexualized stuff. And then that goes to commercial and comes back. And we get the match of Savio Vega taking on Mark Marrow. Who of course comes out with Sable. Um, at one point, Marrow ends up uh, nailing Vegeta, or Vegeta, Savio Vega with a low blow um, while the ref is distracted with Sable. And so uh, this allows Mark Marrow to get the upper hand. And he immediately follows that up by um, getting Savio up into the TKO and hitting that and gets the pin off. So Marrow wins again with a low blow, so a cheap shot. And uh, Michael Cole goes over and tries to interview Sable about uh, how Mark's using you know cheating tactics like the low blow and stuff. He's been doing this for weeks now. And uh, before she can really start to say much of anything, uh, Mark Mara interrupts and starts pushing her to the back and stuff so we never get her r real answer. Then next up we go into a match of Vader taking on the British Bulldog and Bulldog ends up coming out with Jim Nightheart and Furnace and LaFon and this is a dog collar match and so the British Bulldogs team is known as Team Canada and Vader has Team America and uh, they're going to have a match, those two teams, a Survivor Series match at Survivor Series. And so this is obviously, as I mentioned, a dog collar match. So they each have a dog collar or like a collar around their neck with a chain attached, which it's quite a short chain for um, how most like strap matches and stuff are. But this is just like a strap match. So you have the chain around your neck and then you must touch all four turnbuckles without interruptions by the other person and stuff. So it's a lot of like tug of war type stuff. Um, but at one point in the match, the British ball ends up throwing Vader over the top rope to the outside. And so he starts like I guess like hang like with quotations hanging Vader so he's obviously pulling the chain tight while Vader's standing on the floor and stuff but he's holding him there like hanging him and stuff and Team Canada comes up and starts attacking Vader because it's an ODQ match and then they go back to fighting back in the ring and Michael Cole runs over to Furnace and LaFon and starts uh, questioning them about joining Team Canada. And I don't remember the exact which one's which, like, but one of them is from Canada. So he's like, I'm from Canada. What team do you think I'd be on? But the other one is from, I think, Oklahoma or some, because JR obviously mentions that or some. But he's from America and he's like, um, with all this stuff going on in America, it's, it disgusts me. So I'd rather be on Team Canada instead or something. But obviously they're tag partners. So that's why they're both there. But Vader ends up getting the win because he hits the all four turnbuckles, which is kind of unexpected because he hits the turnbuckle. And it's like pause for a second and then the bell, the referee ends up signifying for the bell and the commentator's like, wait, did he hit them all? Oh, I guess he did. So it was like no one really knew what was going on. But immediately following that, Team Canada ends up getting into the ring and they start beating up on Vader. And as that's happening, a man runs into the ring from the crowd. And so they're treating him like a, like just a fan and stuff, but it's Steve Blackman. And so he comes in and starts fighting off the guys to help Vader. And so this is Steve Blackman's first appearance. And uh, Vader ends up fighting his guys off and he goes over and Steve Blackman's on the ground at this point because he was knocked down. And he jumps on top of Blackman. So come to his question, is he like, you know, smothering or like beating up on Blackman? Or is he trying to shield him? Because obviously uh, the team kind of comes over and just all start stomping on Vader and stuff. And so they're not sure which way he's going. But they're obviously commentators treating Steve Blackman as a fan and saying, you know, it's not, fans aren't supposed to get in the ring and they shouldn't do that stuff. But obviously we know it's Steve by history and looking back and stuff. We know it's Steve Blackman and this was just his first appearance. Then from there we go into a match of the New Age Outlaws and the Lo versus the Los Bariquas of Jesus and Jose. And this isn't a really good match and nothing much happens in it. But the um, New Age Outlaws ends up getting the win um, when Billy Gunn does a jump off the top rope onto Jose who was pinning Road Dog at the time. And so he does a move obviously onto him. And then he rolls Jose over and then uh, pulls Road Dog onto the top of Jose and the ref counts the pin. And the Outlaws win. So they're undefeated so far since joining their team together. And then that leads into our main event for the night of Ken Shamrock taking on Shawn Michaels who ends up coming out with DX. 
And uh, so this match wasn't bad, but it was kind of interesting. Um, so at one point, as the match starts out, as soon as Shawn Michaels hits the ring, Shamrock starts attacking him. So Shawn's not even got his ring attire off or anything, like all his chaps, and he has a thing on his chest and stuff. And then uh, Shamrock pretty much dominates most of the match, but especially at the beginning. But it kind of starts to change um, once they're fighting out on the outside. And Shamrock goes to throw Shawn Michaels into the ring post, or he does, or something. I can't remember. So either Shawn moves, or he actually hits or something. But China ends up getting behind Shamrock and shoving him, and sends Shamrock fate, like head first whatever into ring post, kind of knocking him loopy or whatever. So that allows Shawn to get the upper hand. And so back inside the ring, Ken Shamrock ends up or starts to go for his Hurricane Rana that he likes to do, even though he does absolutely horrible. Uh, but he goes for that. But Shawn's able to counter it into a power bomb. And then Sean, after that, goes to try for a sweet chin music, but Shamrock ducks out of it and grabs on to Sean and hits a belly to belly. And then at one point, Shamrock gets distracted by Triple H on the outside. I think he ends up like slapping or hitting Triple H or something. And once he turns around, Sean tries for another sweet chin music, but Shamrock counters it like counters it by grabbing onto his leg and putting him into an ankle lock. So he's got uh, Sean on the ground and he starts to tap, but China's up on the apron, which causes the ref to be distracted. So so he's over dealing with her and Sean's tapping at this point. But since the ref's not paying attention, he's not counting out or him out or whatever. And at that point, Rick Rude gets in the ring and hits Shamrock in the back of the head with his briefcase knocking or knocking Shamrock out or whatever. And at this point, the ref starts to turn around and all of D or Triple H then gets up in the ring and starts attacking Shamrock. So the ref, you know, sees there's an interference or whatever going on. So he calls for the bell. And then, uh, so Shamrock ends up winning the match or whatever by DQ. And then Triple H pedigrees uh, Ken Shamrock onto the briefcase. And that's how the show ends. And so, as I said, that's leading into Survivor Series, which is coming up this weekend. So, obviously, we'll get um, Fallout from that next week. So, that's going to be kind of a big, important episode. So, kind of excited to see that. And it would be nice if I could have enough time and stuff and do, like, a review of pay-per-views. But I don't got enough time, but it would be nice to review uh, Survivor Series. And then from there we go into Nitro, and again this is Nitro 112, again from November 3rd, 1997, and this took place in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, so again going along with Pennsylvania still are both in the same state, and it kicks off with a recap of the Hogan vs. DDP match from last week and the Sting attack, because uh, how Sting came in or whatever and attacked all the NWO and everything. And um, it meant the commentary, or it's mentioned that Hogan and Sting has signed for a match in December. And that goes into commentary where they, you know, talk about that. And then they mention the uh, whole Assault on Devil's Island video or preview, whatever movie from last week. And uh, mention that uh, it has ranked number four on the all-time cable movies premieres or something like that. So playing up, that's a big movie. And they play a video from it. I don't know if it's now or if they play it later. I think it's now or yeah they do the video of it now and it's they show a small part and it looks or it sounds horrible because it just sounds like they're like Hogan and stuff other people are acting or whatever and they're like you know doing a whole shooting scene type thing but then like they recorded their voices separately and then just put it on top of it so you never see Hogan's mouth move but you hear his voice and the same with the girl he's with and stuff so it just sounds horrible um, but then it showed that during a commercial break for the movie there was a contract signing so it showed Hogan at like a press conference thing at the MGM and Grand in Las Vegas, and it uh, showed, you know, he's like saying, Oh, look, Sting's not even here. He's too afraid and scared and everything. And then the door busts open, and Sting comes walking in, and he uh, comes in, signs the contract, and then walks out just staring at Hogan the whole time. So that match has been signed for December, which will be at Starcade. And then that goes into our first match, which is Eddie Guerrero and Dean Malenko taking on Rey Mysterio and Steven Regal. So with all these different guys, it should be a pretty good match. Um, at one point early on, uh, there's and throughout the match, there's a lot of Eddie suck chants, so they keep going with that, that thing, and Eddie sucks, whatever. Um, but Rey Mysterio and Dean Malenko end up starting the match, and of course, there's a lot of great wrestling going on here, as I mentioned. Um, at one point, Rey does a monkey flip I believe on Eddie but Eddie and sends Eddie flying across the ring so like they did in their last match I don't know what happens but Eddie just goes flying across the ring when this happens when he does that and then Ray ends up hitting a hurricane run on Eddie for the pin 
but Dean Malenko comes in and breaks the pinfall. Then uh, William Regal ends up coming in, or Steve Regal, whatever you want. Yeah, Steven Regal ends up coming in, and he's fighting with Eddie, and Eddie uh, ends up falling over. And when he does that, Reg had jumped up onto the top rope to do a springboard and ends up drop kicking Regal because he was aiming for Eddie, but Eddie fall or fell over because of Regal hitting him. And so he drop kicks Regal, and so it kind of sets up issues there. And then at one point, Eddie ends up powerbomb hitting a powerbomb on Ray and then goes up for the frog splash but Dean tags himself in and Dean goes in and puts the Texas Cloverleaf on Ray Mysterio and Ray ta ends up uh, tapping out so they uh, Eddie and Dean end up winning by submission we then get a Nitro Girls dancing on the ramp and the d big WCW sign on the each side of the ramp and stuff so they're dancing up there and then it gives a replay of the Halloween Havoc match or like you know parts of the Halloween Havoc match and talking about how Piper had nerve damage in his face from the attack on by Hogan and stuff when they handcuffed his hand or hands up to the side of the cage and then Hogan hit him in the face with the belt and punched him and stuff like that. Then we get a match of Dave Taylor taking on Fit Finley and this was actually a pretty good entertaining match. As early in the match whatever it shows Raven and a flock walking down through the crowd and of course um, with being in Philadelphia and everything there's a lot of ECW chance going on for them. But back to the match um, with these two of course being uh having the European backgrounds or UK and stuff like that um, they have really stiff match and they're just like laying into each other at least that's what it looks and sounds like it looks like these are actually having a fight with each other but there's a lot of good technical wrestling going on here too but Finley ends up winning with the tombstone pile driver on Dave Taylor then next up we go back to commentary and Eric Bischoff calls on the phone so it kind of like interrupts them or whatever as they're talking and Bischoff mentions that Hogan um, isn't afraid of Sting and he's issued a challenge to sting many times and that he's sorry for Piper's face dam or damage his face whatever that he got but now he has it to go along with his damaged brain and uh, then he moves on to the Assault on Devil's Island movie and says how it was an, a success and every uh, even with everyone putting it down like um, Vince and other reporters stuff so talking about how uh, WWF has made mention of Hogan's movie and stuff like that and from there we go into a match of Psychosis taking on Yuji Nagata coming out with Sonny Ono um, at one point Psychosis Psychosis uh, tries for a plancha over the ring post, but he ends up getting caught on the ring post and just kind of like falls out onto the floor on top of Nagata. So he still like, you know, makes contact with him, but he got caught and fell out of the ring, which was funny. Um, but then at one point, Sonny Ono gets up on the apron uh, and does the distraction to the ref, and he ends up kicking Psychosis, who's bouncing off the rope at that time. And so the ref, you know, is distracted by talking to him that he doesn't notice that Sonny Ono like kicks Psychosis or whatever. And so uh, Psychosis ends up going down to the kick and a god is able to put on the reverse figure four for the win uh the next up there's a raven promo and this time he's in an empty classroom and and it's uh of course there's all sorts of like voices and talking going on or whatever in the background but uh he mentions how it was there in the classroom that he learned about the evil of humanity so like the mean stuff kids do and everything and that goes into our next match of disco inferno taking on saturn so this is the first saturn match we've seen and this is for the tv title um so early in the match uh disco attacks saturn as soon as he hits the ring because obviously disco is whatever the underdog in this match so he's trying to get an attack on early but saturn gets the upper hand pretty easily and uh to start off he first gets an arm bar on the disco but before disco could tap out or anything he hits his feet on the rope and then as i mentioned saturn's dominating the match and he starts working over disco's left shoulder setting up for his finisher then at one point during the match the um all the crowds uh start standing up and they're watching the arena on the opposite side of the entrance so something over in that direction is happening but it never shows it so i assume there's some sort of like fan causing problems a fight or just something going on that uh, caused all the fans to look but we never get to see what it was but saturn ends up getting disco into the rings of saturn so that's his finisher and disco submits to it so saturn is the new tv champ and the flock all comes into the ring to like celebrate or whatever even though with the way they are they don't really celebrate any type of thing but they're kind of what are having a party <laughs> i guess you could say for the him winning the title and that leads into a mean gene interview on the ramp with rick flair and Ric Flair mentions just how he's um, going to be searching for Kurt Henning to get revenge tonight. So if he sees him, he's going to be after him. And then he challenged the NWO to come after him because he'll take on each of them too. That goes into hour two of the night, which has the Nitro Girls dancing in the ring. And then from there, it goes into a match of Scott Hall taking on Chris Jericho. But of course, before the match starts, 
Um, Scott Hall does a survey of the crowd, and they're here. This um, they respond this time, whatever highly for NWO. But as they're doing it or whatever, there's a lot of Larry chants um, at the same time, obviously for Larry Zabisco. And then Scott Hall ends up calling out Larry Zabisco and ends up playing a video of the video of Eric Bischoff beating Zabisco, of course, with uh, Hall's help at Halloween Havoc. But back into the match, the match is pretty short overall, but early on, uh, Scott Hall starts to set up Chris Jericho for the Outsider's Edge, but Jericho's able to counter out of it. And then Jericho does a roll-up pin on Scott Hall, front, so he gets the win out of there, but immediately after that, Hall gets um, back at him or whatever, so he starts beating up on Chris Jericho, and then hits him with two Outsiders Edges, and so, you know, he may have lost, but he won the war, whatever that they say, and that causes Larry Zabisco to come out to the ring, and uh, he, you know, kind of gets him away from Jericho for one, but then he gets in the ring, and Scott Hall leaves, and uh, Zabisco's trying to get Hall to sign the contract so they can have a match or whatever, and he's holding the paper up, and Hall's just walking to the back the whole, super slow the whole time, and Larry's just calling him a coward and a chicken and stuff and to sign the contract. That goes into another Mike Tenay's Luchador report and this time it's on high flying moves and so this shows a lot of like it'll show the name or mention the name of the uh, uh, high flying move and then it'll show a video of one of the Luchadors doing the move so it's kind of a cool little thing learning you know Luchador moves and everything. And then that leads into a Luchador 8 man battle royal but as soon as all the men get into the ring and they start the match the giant ends up coming out to the ring and he uh, starts fighting with and chokes slamming all the luchadors and the luchadors end up escaping the ring and run back up the ramp or whatever to the back and then the giant grabs a microphone and starts cutting a promo on kevin ash because of course setting up a feud for them too uh then we get another nitro girl segment on the ramp leading into a match of alex wright coming out with deborah taking on rick flair as soon as flair's walking out to the ring he's like looking in the camera and he makes a comment that Mongo gave me permission she's gonna ride Space Mountain tonight of course referencing Deborah and saying that Mongo gave him permission to sleep with his wife and stuff and so that was just kind of funny in my opinion that he said that on TV uh, but in the match of course Ric Flair's doing a lot of uh, flare chops or whatever to Alex right and they sound uh, uh, really loud and stuff so he's really putting them into Alex right there but at one point Ric Flair does his flip over the turnbuckle out onto the floor and then is able to get back up and get the upper hand again and ends up putting the figure four on Alex Wright for the win. And then from there we go into a match of Ray Trailer taking on Steve Mongo McMichael. And so as the match starts out, each guy's just trying to overpower each other. So both of these are, you know, two big guys and stuff. So they're just trying to like show who's stronger and stuff. Um, then at one point Mongo starts doing his three point stance. So obviously the football stance since he was a football player. And uh, he does that and starts attacking Ray's leg, but he never really does anything with that or whatever. Um, but at one point, Ray ends up reversing it and then starts working on Mongo's leg, so kind of taking him out. So I guess um, usually small guys do that to big guys, to, you know, like take them down the size or whatever. But ever, but I guess two big guys can do it too. But at one point during the match, Goldberg ends up walking down the aisle um, to the ringside or whatever and is causes a distraction for Mongo and Ray's able to hit the trailer slam on him for the win. Then next up we got a Mean Gene interview in the ring with DDP and uh, DDP comes out and talk, just mentions how he's living the dream by being on the largest pay-per-view ever or being like headliner or whatever the largest pay-per-view ever and then how he beat Hogan last week. So he's just kind of living the dream right now. And then he vows to win the match at World War III because that's our next pay-per-view coming up. And so that's where they have the giant match with the three rings and it's the big battle royal type thing. We then get our last Nitro Girls segment on the ramp and then that goes into a public enemy versus the Steiners coming out with Ted DiBiase and this is a Philadelphia street fight and of course with Public Enemy and stuff there's again more ECW, ch ECW chants and then stuff like that or whatever throughout the match whenever hardcore type stuff starts going on. But as the match starts out, they're fighting all over the arena, so they're going up like towards the ramp and then um, into the crowd and everything. At one point, uh, Rocco ends up climbing up the rigging around the commentary so commentary has their own like platform and then there's four pillars of like rigging type stuff that go up and he ends up climbing up on top of that and then jumps off off of it onto scott steiner on the floor 
And then they fight back towards the ring while Rick and Johnny Grunge are fighting in the around ringside and in the crowd and stuff. But they end up going back towards the ring and uh, Rock Rock ends up grabbing hold of Rick and throwing him on the bottom of a double stack of tables. So, you know, one table on top of the other. And he kind of just like throws him onto the bottom table. But he's only got like, you know, he's only like his chest or whatever chest and head are on the table and stuff but his whole body's not and then johnny's up on the top rope and he jumps off to do like a move through the table and kind of like smash rick but as he's doing that uh ted DiBiase like reaches in to pull rick off the table but he doesn't do it and rick doesn't move in enough time so the table clips rick steiner in the back of the head and johnny falls through the table and gets taken out and the table you know as i said mentioned smashes on rick's head Scott Steiner comes over and gets on top of Johnny Grunge on the outside of the ring and pins him and so they win the match and then you see Rick all mad and stuff and shows him and there's just blood running down his head and everything so he got cut open from that table on his head and that goes into our main event for the night of Kurt Henning taking on Lex Luger. And so this is a big match or whatever. And so we got Michael Buffer doing the introduction. Um, at one point in the match, Kurt Henning is doing like having an argument or a fight very early. It's either very early or as soon as he comes out. I can't remember which one. But uh, he's doing having an argument with a fan at ringside, like really intense fight, like argument. So I don't know if it was like a plan or someone he knew or if the guy had done something to him and it just pissed Henning off. I'm not exactly sure. But in the match, Kurt Henning ends up hitting the double clothesline and the bionic elbow on Henning. And he starts to go for the torture act, but uh, Kurt Henning grabs onto the ropes and pulls Lex Luger over the rope to the outside. And then... Um, as the kind of like fight or begin to fight on the outside or something, Kurt Henning's out there now. And Ric Flair runs up and attacks him from behind. And so they start fighting, whatever. And Henning rolls back into the ring to like try and get away from Flair. And Luger's there. And so Luger picks him up and puts him in the torture rack and is starting to do that. But then Layer, Flair gets in the ring and then runs up and like hits Luger or something and causes Luger to drop Kurt Henning. And so Flair starts going after Luger again. And they all start running to the back, of course, Henning in front, followed by Ric Flair. And and then like Sluger. And then like as soon as they hit the entrance ramp part where they go into the back and you can't see him. Of course Henny disappears. And then Luger kind of like grabs a hold of Flair or something. And they both stop. And so they're just both standing there right at the entrance. And they're like staring at each other. And then start arguing and yelling at each other. So that's where the show ends there. Um, so both again. Both were not that bad this week. And I forgot to say the ratings, but Raw ended up having a 2.6 and Nitro had a 4.0. So again, obviously Nitro is still winning at this point. But like I said, both episodes weren't that bad. I think Raw would probably be my um, favorite out of the two. Just overall with like the people and stuff and in the matches that the way they turn out and everything. And again, Nitro was over two hours. It wasn't a three hour, but it was over two. So just having that longer time is just difficult to see. And every time I see it, I'm like, oh, but... I made it through it. Um, but that's going to be it for the Monday Night Rewind podcast this week. So I hope you enjoyed. If you did, don't forget on Apple Pod, you can subscribe and follow on Apple Podcasts. You can leave a review and a rating there. You can also follow us on SoundCloud so you can find the podcast versions of it there. Or you can see it on YouTube at Awesome Nerd Show. And you can see the Monday Night Rewind there every weekend with the new episode. So on there, of course, you can like it if you want, leave any comments, or subscribe to the channel so you never miss a new episode. But if you could do all that for me, and I hope you enjoyed, and we'll see you next time.